Um, I think there is something very liberating around having a haircut that you previously probably couldn't have done for whatever reason. That's right. And and now you can, and and that's an amazing thing. That's it. Uh, my mother-in-law hates it. Hates it. And, like, reminds me every chance. She's like, oh, I was looking at a picture of you yesterday. You look so much younger with short hair. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's funny. Because... I find that when you assert your own freedom, a lot of the world that never asserted theirs shows up with an opinion. <laughs> uh-huh. and, and, and and I've been having to tell my girlfriend this because we're in the process of moving to South America this year. I'm like, nobody's going to give you permission to go. You know, not that she needed it, but you know, like your mom's not going right. to send, send you off with like the grandest. I can't wait to be five hours away from my daughter. Like nobody's doing that. So you got to just go for it. You're moving to South America? Yeah, to Medellin, Colombia, um, June 1st. Whoa, dude. Are you, uh, are you running Guardian from there? Yeah, I'll be running Guardian from there. Um, I was there for the whole month of July. I had the busiest month I had ever. That's when I was working with one of your guys, Chris Karsten. And um, it's central time zone. It's not a big deal. Um, yeah. But yeah, kind of like, I guess the hair thing, you know, at a high level, it's like, I can now, like, there's no office I need to go into. There's no like local staff I need to like rile up. Is part of it um, tax benefits or you just want to live on the ocean or? Um, Most of it's just lowering cost of living. Um, Long story short, and I've said some of this to Chelsea before, like doing some of the Wall Street PE stuff. I just felt like the more money I needed to make to live the life I wanted to live, the more behinds I had to kiss. And yeah. and Walker, I'm not the best at, at kissing them. So I, yeah. if I can lower my expenses, um, yeah. I think I'll be a happier person overall. Plus, like, yeah. I did not start a family for many years because business just kind of prevailed. And not that I'm starting one, but like working with my, my girlfriend and her daughter. Like, there's other things in life I need to devote time to than just my job. I got. I gotta let these students in, or they're gonna wonder if I'm here. Sure. Um. Uh. I mean, I think we're good to go. Any questions or anything before we? I'll probably do a little talking. I've got a, an announcement or two, and we'll just kind of roll into it. Cool. That's perfect. Sounds good. I'll, I'll also let you know. Um. Um. I we run a lot of. I sort of. They watch you said. Okay, we're gonna start the semester with everyone remote, fully remote, hundred percent. And I sure. just kind of said, fuck it, we're doing the whole thing. Like Chelsea and I have built this whole thing like we're just going to start doing it virtual and so right we watch a lot of pre-recorded content and this is like the discussion okay okay and so we do discussion slash guest speaker all at once and they're only required to be here for like 30 minutes okay so if people start popping out don't take it personally those are just students that don't care that's fine and there will be students that are going to hang on and really want to talk to you like you'll see you know but so it's 100 percent your schedule you usually go about 45 minutes but Perfect. Hey, Elliot. Hey, Chelsea. Oh, wow. Hey, team. How are we doing? Don, Matt, Max, Robert, Jason. Great. Stay good. Good, you. good. Robert, Lily. Love it. Hey guys, yeah, so sorry I am Chloe, good to see you. Um, sorry I'm a couple of minutes uh, after punctual. Luis, good to see you, man. Uh, listen guys, we've, we've got a great a great speaker today. Uh, before, before I introduce Elliot, I want to um, just mention a couple of things. First of all, number one, kind of per usual, uh, if anyone's having any problems with Canvas or just Hit record, of- Everett, or Everett Walker, whoever you are. Hit record. Recording you, in progress. If anyone's got any any hangups or or you know trip ups with Canvas or, or getting access to anything or or is a little confused or just needing guidance or, or any kind of resources that aren't quite in there, um, please go ahead and just start texting Chelsea right now while she's here. Um, that'd be helpful. Uh, number two, um, quietly dropped the final project on Canvas last night. 
Uh, we're going to um, have a little time to talk about that on Thursday. Um, and uh, there's going to be groups of four or five people. Uh, you do have the choice to uh, choose your own groups. Uh, you also have the choice to just uh, write me and say that you would like to be paired uh, with, with uh, other people. So wh whatever that is. It's way easier for us to just sort of automatically pick them, but I want to give you that freedom. So we're going we're gonna to do that. Um, I'd say please let me know by Thursday. The problem is my email is still um, buggy. My watch you email is somehow buggy. So we're working through that. So let's just wait until Thursday. But you can start. Go read the project. You know, you can get email your, me too, Rocker, if you need them to. Great. Email Chelsea. Um, she obviously knows what's going on. And um, it's going to be awesome. So, yeah, here we go. Chelsea at bythenville.com. Um, you know, I, I think the thing is, is like the, the, the sort of lecture for today um, was Bill Worsima at Miller Cooper, right? And he runs financial due diligence. He does the diligence um, uh, kind of talk at Northwestern. Um, I, I've, known him, I've known him for years, right? And the thing is, is like, it's, that lecture is really good at sort of talking about, you know, from a kind of an academic perspective, why you want to you know, do financial due diligence and maybe how it's approached and some of the sort of loopholes that it can, that it can kind of cause, right? Um, Bill works at a big CPA firm. Um, a lot of people that, that run um, financial due diligence or acquisitions obviously work at big CPA firms. Um, a student last year going through this, this class said to me after class one day, he said, Walker, the thing is, is like everything we learn in business school is, is, is pretty cool. But what's really unique about this class is that it's like, it's like street. It's like you're out there and you're doing it. You're doing like M&A in the back alley and you're like doing this thing. And the thing is, is that like you watch, you watch, you know, the, a lot of these lectures, right? It's sort of like this academic, almost like ivory tower kind of, kind of thing. And the thing is, is that um, Elliot Holland, who's our speaker today, uh, started as the founder of Guardian Due Diligence, okay? And the thing is, is that um, uh, Elliot had the right background, uh, the right personality, the right expertise, the right timing in order to launch Guardian and really sort of emerge as, if not the leader, a key leader in helping uh, self-funded searchers and, and search funds. Um, in their in their due diligence needs, and so um, I wanted to sort of do the one-two punch, right? We had the, the pre-recorded kind of academic foundation uh, with Bill Worsima, and now we've got the actual what the hell is going on? Like, what you know? Why do we do it? Like, you know, what happens with 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 Elliot Holland here um, today? So, um, Elliot, thank you so much um, for for joining us here today. Yes, good to um, be here. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. The, the 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 floor is yours, my friend. Yeah, so um, Walker gave a great introduction. So um, I will not bore you with a long background, but um, after finishing HBS, I was working in private equity, um, realized the name of the game was owning equity and you don't do that at somebody else's shop. So I rolled out with a mentor of mine and started an independent sponsor firm, which the lines between independent sponsor and self-funded searcher are very thin, let's put it that way. Um, and after years and years of sort of evaluating our quality of earnings and financial diligence solutions, I just thought the solutions that were on the market weren't enough generally, weren't great, and really weren't great for sort of first time buyers and a lot of the folks in the ETA market, because in the private equity world where I lived, you had a bunch of former Wall Street bankers, endless budgets for like BCG or bank consulting, uh, feasibility studies, market studies, operational diligence studies. You had a bunch of experts at like GLG you could pay, you know, a thousand dollars an hour to understand stuff. This whole army of people to work on this hundred million dollar deal. But on an ETA deal of three million, five million, six million, you don't have it. So for me, diligence is all about, and I love the street analogy because it's the real diligence is all the stuff nobody wants to do that kind of is in the back alley. And, um, would be backhanded in any other context except that you're putting up a million plus dollars to buy a business and a personal guarantee a lot of times if you're self-funded. And so it's it's your business all of a sudden. So um, I don't like boring folks. My background is not like accounting audit. It's like a deal guy and now I manage a team of 20 
accountants. But really what I want to talk about was um, what is diligence when it goes wrong? So I kind of want to tell you and talk through one of the war stories that I spend a lot of time with people on because some of this is street and you have to sort of feel it. And then I want to talk through some challenges that sort of, I think there's about 12 challenges that pretty much every buyer, particularly first time buyer has to kind of get through in order to get a good deal done. And I think it kind of sets the table for some decent Q and A. So um, if I put anybody to sleep so far, sorry. Um, if not, um, I'm going to hop right in. I think go ahead and ask questions in real time. I think I've done this with Walker and um, Chelsea before, and I can sort of try to fill them in real time. If not, catch them at the end. But um, please don't be shy because I won't. So um, when I was doing independent sponsor deals, one of the most like prolific stories was a security business I looked to buy in Texas, north of Dallas. And call it $700,000 of SDE, seller's discretionary earnings. And I like the industry because a lot of contracts and the deal seemed manageable for the budget I had. Got the confidential information memorandum, looked through it, looked fine, submitted a letter of intent. And before the guy was going to sign the letter of intent, he wanted me to come visit him. So no big deal. I understand that. So fly down to Texas, and one of the things that I really wanted to dig into from a diligence perspective was how solid were the financials, how solid was the sales discretionary earnings, and really like the whole system that the financials were in. So the guy hadn't told his employees, or at least all of them, that he was selling, so he wanted to meet me at a Starbucks. So we get to the Starbucks, and before I can even get my foot inside of Starbucks, we're on like the front steps. This guy's like, man, you won't believe this. Ugh, I've been on the phone with QuickBooks all day. My online QuickBooks shut down today. I can't get the financials. And I'm like, I got this guy coming from Atlanta to come check out my financials. Like, and this is the day you guys will screw up my QuickBooks. I got my accountant back at the office working on it. We'll get through this just fine. So at that moment, Every logical, I'm an engineer by trade, every whiteboard, everything in me was like, go back to your car, go back to the airport, fly home, right? But if you're self-funded, you already have sunk cost of going to Dallas and coming back. So what do you do? You get rid of one hotel night, maybe, because you're not going to get it back. So my thought process was, let me figure out how bad this person would lie to try to get me to give them $1.5 million on this deal. So I went through the motions. So I go check out the operation. I go talk to his folks. I was really ready to leave day two. He's like, no, no, no. I got all my sales guys ready to talk to you. I know you're kind of upset about the QuickBooks thing, but just talk to my guys. Otherwise, they'll think something's up. So I spent like three hours talking to a sales guy's deals to um, day two, all of which had a lie, a, a 60 minute lie created by the, the seller to make me think this business was doing well, was solid. Now for the non IT people, for QuickBooks online to be down for two days, given that they have like 99.999% uptime, it would be on like CNN.com, right? So I just want to put that into context. So like at the end of this, I know this guy's lying. So I go back home, but it was one of the stories that sort of gets you into the mindset of what you have to do and what length people will go to to misrepresent things. Because I say this a lot, even a reasonable person in the context of selling a business has probably their biggest incentive to lie because every dollar of profit they convince you is there that isn't, they don't get dollar for dollar benefit. They get three to five times that benefit. So that's why you have to be in back alleys, checking around corners and being really solid about how you look at things. Elliot, I'd like to say that um, one, one of the reasons I became a broker is because, um, well, number one, I just love doing transactions. But number two, because, you know, there's not a lot of sort of like, you know, mid-career MBAs doing it. In other words, right. yeah. brokers don't know what the hell they're doing almost all of the time. Right. Right. And so, so I, I imagine a lot of what you're doing is sort of 
recasting uh, PLs that are presented to you just to see if ad backs are really ad backs. Yeah, a lot of it is as simple as that. And, you know, I'm sort of like Walker, kind of a different breed for the, the, the job that I'm in. Um, it's not a lot of like Harvard MBAs running around here doing QOEs, but I kind of love it. And I think it, it scratches my itch for the deal capacity too. A lot of it is recasting, but I will say we're in the street today, right? So recast is still like a fancy word. Part of it is understanding if the whole thing is hogwash. And that's what just happened in Dallas, right? The other thing is understanding, and I always kind of bring my engineering um, mindset to this, like garbage in, garbage out, right? So if the controller is just average for a million dollar business, they're probably bottom quartile given all the bookkeepers in the world, right? And if the CPA firm that gets paid 1500 bucks every year to do their taxes, but can't tell you that because they work for the sellers and now you're asking their CPA these tough questions, part of it is sort of, this is a security business with this revenue, with this customer base. What's the average profit for businesses like this? What jobs does this business have to do to be successful? Can I understand how those jobs are executed? Who's doing them? Who's staying? Who's leaving? And really the financials are just a manifestation of all the operational stuff that happens in a business. I mean, the thing that's funny to me sometimes is people forget that. Like the financials are just the, the, the simplest um, single point where everybody agrees on how to present business operations, right? Because otherwise everybody has a different slide, a different... Uh, model. And so a lot of it is figuring out if it's totally fictitious, recasting it, like Walker said, and oftentimes realizing in, in smaller deals, I'm talking about deals under $5 million in enterprise value, under $10 million in enterprise value. Sometimes like 30% of the stuff is off, like not according to gap um, accounting, but sort of directionally correct. And the deal's still good. And I think that's one way that Walker and I get along really well is like, you're not looking for perfect financials, perfect company. It's really like, is the business worth what you're paying for? Alec, can you tell us what a, what a QOV is, just in case anyone in the room isn't familiar? No, great, great start. So if you are a public company, you have to get an audit. So every year you have to go to some big accounting firm and you have one accounting firm that you hire that does it um, initially. And you have another firm that comes and says, I'm working for the shareholders to make sure the first firm is solid. Um, the QOE is a very analogous thing to an audit. It's not a full audit, but it's sort of a evaluation of the financials of a private company that's cost effective for, you know, small and medium M&A transactions. One of the simple analogies I give and um, this analogy won't even be here in, in 10 years, Walker, you're going to laugh. Like if you go buy a used car from your neighbor, you know, somebody selling like a, a Chevy something, right? And you get on the road and it's 10,000 bucks and he's got all the records, you know, everything's there. The car looks clean, fresh paint job. And you're like, hey, I love the car, but before I buy it, because it's as is, I need to take it to my mechanic to make sure all the things you said are true. Um, the quality of earnings is like your mechanic in an M&A transaction, the person you trust that you pay to protect your interests, because just like buying a used car, a business is sold as is. And so what it ends up being is a 30 page document that looks at the income statement, the balance sheet, cash flow, um, EBITDA, adjustments to EBITDA to get to a final adjusted EBITDA. And typically three to five other things like margin per category um, or sometimes sales per customer, whatever is sort of important. And so you get like a 30 page document that by the time you look through it or your lender looks through it or your business partner looks through it, it's like the basis where everybody can have a solid discussion about the financials of the business um, with sort of accounting level clarity. So you take something that's like a a lifestyle business many days, right? Where somebody's running a lot of personal expenses through it and all the rest. And you turn it into something that's financeable by a bank like a Live Oak or a Chase or whoever. And so that's the product that I that I deliver. And I think 
the deal orientation and my background allows me to look at the process more efficiently, understand how the different dollars that come in and out can be used to make decisions. Because a lot of times what happens, like my clients will get the quality of earnings back and the, the trailing 12 month cash flow or EBITDA is a million bucks. Um, but what they're trying to figure out is should I pay $4 million for this business, right? And it's, it's helpful to have the QOE to make that determination, but the QOE by itself without a good advisor or having the knowledge in yourself can be a little bit tough to make. And so helping people sort of get across that, that, that barrier. Yeah, I th Elliot, I think it's, it's one of these things where, you know, I, I hope that, I, I hope that everyone on this call would agree that, you know, if you're going to acquire a business and you have an investor okay, or multiple investors, let's say it's a traditional search fund. Um, I, I hope that everyone on this call understands the importance of getting, you know, Two sets of eyes are better than, right? So we, we all want to make sure that we've got another set of eyes going through the books other than you. In fact, you know, um, anyone who's running diligence or helping you run diligence, I, you know, I know there's JDs on this call as well. Don't take this personally, Matt, et cetera. But, you know, it's one of these where I always am like, you know, I'd rather spend a dollar on diligence rather than a dollar on legal, right? It's not an either or question but the point is is that diligence will help me understand you know true or false i want to buy this company right whereas legal will just help protect me once i've already decided to to acquire it or not right so elliot i mean i guess one of the big questions is um you know like you do you do a lot of deals you've been you've been engaged a lot of times and what like it's, it's kind of it's kind of funny that you know, if, you're, if, you, if, if someone in diligence is engaged on a project and then they go in and then they check every corner, right? And they right. come back and they're like, yeah, everything that was presented to you is good. You're good to go. No comments. Like, it's almost like they're like, what? Right. Like, <laughs> right. Right. Like, what did I just pay you for? Like, they right. want you to find stuff. Right. But the truth is, is that what we really want is the confirmation that everything's good. Right? Exactly. So I guess my question is sort of like, what are the outcomes? like like of, of your work in other words if when you're engaged and you go in you know feel free to you know segment this however you want but i'm trying to, i'm trying to get at like like what are the odds that i'm like going in to buy a company and like it's a total farce right. it's a little messed up it's clean you know, you know or 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 we have reason after diligence of renegotiating because of xyz like we're like sure sort of and all of these are approximate and they're based on sort of my volume of deals. So I did 50 quality of earnings last year. Um, and so all of them, well, not all of them, 90% of them under $5 million for self-funded folks. And, and my clients tend to be people who have invested in like real estate or a public market portfolio that understand, like Walker does the benefit of spending a dollar of sort of like business acquisition insurance, making sure everything is good. What I found is outside of the ones that as soon as you looked in the data room, they get kicked out. So once once they pass like the two day test, roughly 70 percent of the deals um, are sort of good enough and directionally correct enough for my clients to still want to do the transaction. Of seven. that 70, okay, okay. of that seven, um, 70 percent, probably a third of those some sort of renegotiation a bigger seller note, a slightly different price, a different structure, um, earn out, whatever the case may be. Um, a third are sort of clean enough where I'm presenting things that aren't 100% gap accounting, but they're sort of like, they're academic. Again, we're in the streets today. So like there's an academic uh, working capital or like cash basis or accrual basis, right? But if I explain that to my client who's not an account, I lost him. If I explain that to the seller who's not an account, I lost him. And so what I'm telling them is, hey, it's not according to Gap, but your cash flow is solid. And then the other third is sort of small things that somebody has to get over. And Walker lives this, right? So as, as a broker, you're trying to put a good deal together or understand that these two parties might not be good and move them apart. You know, sometimes the seller has to take a bit of pain. Sometimes the buyer has to take a bit of pain and, and that's kind of how 
they, they, they roughly ship out. So then the 30% that um, the clients don't pursue after the quality of earnings, as soon as you end up with like fraud or malicious intent, or you feel like you're lied to as a buyer, that sort of kills deals, whether the numbers are good or not. Um, when people are selling like a job business where they're too connected to the company for someone else to run it, that ends up being a bit of that too. And then sometimes the seller is a solid person telling the truth, but between their controller and their CPA and their lack of understanding, by the time you really get to what um, EBITDA is or profit is, it's like a third of what you thought it was before, but then you can't really negotiate like on a $1.4 million deal that you want to give the person $500,000. So those deals kind of blow up. But that kind of gives you a sense of where we are. Now, what I will also say on top of that, again, if you know like the process from like sourcing, evaluating, submitting letters of intent, getting signed letters of intent, I show up right around signed letters of intent. So there's a lot of stuff before that, that um, the variability is higher. But once you kind of get to LOI, I think those are about the odds. Sorry, guys, I don't want to hog the floor. Please um, raise your hand if you got a question. I, I, you know, I think of, Elliot, I, I think of the one thing that I, that I haven't actually um, talked to the students about is, guys, there's sort of like three types, like diligence kind of falls into three categories, right? Like it's, it's financial due diligence, legal due diligence, and operational due diligence. But, you know, would, would you... How would I, what's my question? It's along the lines of like, obviously financial due diligence is easy to kind of scope out, right? And understanding that it's fully custom per deal, what are we looking at, right? And yes. there's sort of this custom checklist for this deal. Um, does Guardian or do you feel like other diligence firms do things beyond financial diligence and maybe into, into operational? Or how does the order of events occur? Or how does one sort of point to the other or in, or how do they interact? Sure. So when I go back to sort of my, my private equity background, I think about in business school, it's like, what are the jobs to do like Walker laid out? So financial, the QOE kind of handles a lot of that. You have um, operational, which is sort of how do you run the business? How good are the systems? Um, how good are the processes? How well do they deliver consistent cash flow? And then you have commercial, like how good is the market? How good is demand for the product? Um, how powerful are suppliers, customers, kind of the Porter's Five Forces stuff. And so a lot of diligence firms, which are big CPA firms, they've got great accountants, but they stop at financial, right? They don't have any basis to talk to you about operational. They've never been on a plant floor. They've never serviced an HVAC unit. Um, and then they're not commercial folks either. It's not like these guys or gals are former investment bankers or like Bain consultants, right? And so what we try to do is, is take a step further and push people into a reasonable understanding of the basics that you need to know to cover kind of operational and um, commercial. So Elliot, what the heck does all that mean? Um, the way that I talk about it is there's about 12 challenges that each buyer must overcome right and and they kind of coincide to the different pieces but they also coincide with like parts of the deal so like you have to get past your own diligence one you need to get to the point where you feel the seller is a reasonable person two you have to get data from the seller's cpa or bookkeeper in order to do the quality of earnings and that's sort of like financial right but now you got to also think about how do you work with, understand, and I'll say it from a buyer perspective, not that anybody manages a free human being, but sort of manage the broker situation, right? You need to build trust with the seller because the seller is not going to believe a person right out of business school is going to be able to buy their $5 million business without you working with them and through some things. You're going to have to work through, can you... Um, can you run the business without the um, seller? Because that seller and the SBA loans is gonna be gone. And even if you're not doing an SBA loan, the likelihood that after they get a big check, they're gonna be as incentive is low. 
is the industry any good, which is another piece. And then you kind of have to put all that together and say, those things sort of have to be reasonable for me to want to keep going. And then, um, Matt, we're going to bring you back in here. Now you have to go into a purchase agreement that you're going to draft more than likely how to work with the seller's lawyer and, and not run up a $30,000 legal bill just because you want to argue. You're going to have to think about um, your lender process, how to market your deal to a lender and how to get through that process. And then typically people have other constituents that are in the deal, spouse, family, um, business partner, et cetera. So when you think about sort of the challenges that a, a buyer has to go through, they're kind of separated again, financial. The first couple of ones that I talked to are really, really financial. Then you have sort of the middle part, which is commercial and operational kind of combined. And then once I kind of got to the legal piece, that's a bit into the legal part. We don't do legal due diligence, but if you think about the process and, and why Walker said he'd rather spend a dollar on financial diligence than legal, although you need to get both done right, the things that you find as risks in financial diligence, you need to mitigate in the purchase agreement. And so really you should be reading your quality of earnings. What are the top five risks? And then going to your lawyer and saying, hey, on top of the standard purchase agreement for a deal this size, what are the ways that I can mitigate these top five risks that I found in diligence? So that's really how, how this goes. And, and what ends up happening for a lot of folks is um well walker i'll ask the question back to you so we can have some fun okay. how how much work is it getting through that process with all those things that you have to do as a self-funded searcher particularly someone who may be working a part-time or full-time job while they're doing this process are people under allocated or maybe a little over allocated you mean getting getting through the process to a point where you're actually ready to close or where you're ready to close and have done enough work where I'll talk about the self-funded searcher specifically, right? Because funded, I think, is a bit different. But as a self-funded searcher, like the, the 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 how much how to get through the process where you are comfortable enough putting up like a two million dollar personal guarantee, knowing that the bank can take your house, that they'll be, you know, taking your money for a long time. Is that is that a 10 hours a week process or, or can it be pretty, pretty intense? Oh, it's pretty intense, but but I think I think it's also I mean, you know, Elliot, my experience, it's sort of like the first time I did it, it took me like years. Like it took me like two years to be like I'm actually going comfortable enough to close on something, right? right. Like there's this whole thing that happened. Um, however, uh, there's there's been um, multiple times. I think three companies I bought, I saw the the the, the business summary from the broker on you know Thursday I talked to the seller on Friday I put it in an LOI on Saturday we were under LOI by Monday and yep. like, you know I closed it you know eight weeks later you know what I mean? sure. so, but, the, but to your point to your point what, once you're sort of past that the thing that I always share with buyers is you, you touched on it, Elliot it's it's the minute that you don't trust the seller get out of there yeah just get out of there because it's not, nothing good is going to happen um um a good friend of mine who coincidentally has a jd from washu yeah um uh, uh bought a company didn't trust the owner was like this guy is the problem like he's a little shady like blah 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 whatever yeah closes the deal finds out that the whole business was built in his image and everyone's a liar. <laughs> like poor communication, everyone's hiding stuff, everyone's lying to each other. And then all of a sudden, um, something they missed was this, this big accounts receivable came back and none of it got paid. All the inventory came back and uh, the buyer um, almost filed personal bankruptcy. I mean, it was just a total disaster and it's a perfect case study of what happens if you don't listen to your gut. You know? I'm actually being an expert witness in a case just like that, uh, Walker, where the seller stuffed the channel ahead of uh, the sale, um, got an inflated um, multiple because he kind of sent stuff to people um, that he knew would take a while to come back. And then when the buyer took ownership, all the returns came back, all that inventory came back. 
And um, they want to just say that the that impacted working capital and not sort of EBITDA and purchase price. And sort of I'm testifying that that's not really the way it goes. But they they paid two times what they should have for that business, right? Um, which is tough. And then another example. So first off, let me address what Walker said. As you get into this more, you can make decisions quicker, just like anything else in your life, right? Like your first job, you were like, oh my God, what's going to happen? You know, now you're on two or three, you can do diligence, you can figure it out, you're much better. And so I had a discussion on Twitter the other day about this, like seasoned buyers can look at five to six things most times, get a QOE done, um, have a lawyer they've worked with, and they're off, they're off to go. That's what Walker was talking about. As a first time person, you're taking a risk without having experience. So you have to mitigate sort of first timer risk um, in your transaction and be smart about it. Um, the other thing I'll say is there was a situation where uh, a friend of mine bought a company where the it was a trucking company where the trucking company had over invoiced customers. And then these big like multinational logistics companies people are processing those invoices and then auditing them like once a year, once a quarter. And so it was a family business. So like the first two generations left and the third generation was in the business running it. And his family had a seller note. Six months later, my buddy gets a call from the bank that they cut off his um, revolving credit line. And he's like, what the what? He's driving to Kansas, trying to figure it out. Lo and behold, he finds out that they over invoice customers leading up to the sale to juice the EBITDA. Now his working capital line is gone. He's trying to get his investors to put more money in the business. And he spent a lot of time trying to put that deal back on the on the rails. And so, but for every story like that, there's stories of people making goo gobs of money doing this and really having a great time. So I'm not trying to scare anyone. I'm just saying it's in your best interest to do your due diligence so you feel comfortable, you know? If you're a mechanic, you can buy a used car without taking it to your, your mechanic, right? If you're an accountant, you may want to go get a mechanic, right? Because you're, you're in over your head. Jonathan. Hey, how you guys doing? I'm sorry. I had a question, like, with regards to being, like, a self-funded searcher and then coming in and actually looking at the, do, at the diligence after. And, you know, like, have you had, like, any experiences where people have, like, not agreed with the due diligence that came through or they felt like weird about like how it kind of goes yeah people yell at me sometimes um <laughs> <I'm sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> um and, and when you're an expert you kind of like that's part of the job it's a million dollars passing through these transactions right so to your question directly um and i had to explain this to someone um so some of these businesses are 20 years old, right? So they have 20 years of information, secrets, um, customers, accounts receivable, warranties they had to you know, go back and fix. And then my job is in four weeks to uncover enough to give somebody a 30 page document that gives them an overview of whether they should um, consider this business or not. So am I absolutely doing an amazing job? Oh, I take my work very seriously. But can I find everything that's happened over 20 years and four weeks with limited data? No. And so I'll tell you a specific situation. So I had a buyer who was a bit cantankerous, right? A bit of a pain in the butt. Um, and a selling group that were all sort of older school professional service people. So kind of like not just a bit of a pain in the butt, but sort of like, um, these younger folks couldn't possibly know anything. Everything you do is wrong. And so I got on a call with my client and the seller's CPA. And what we do is a proof of cash. John. So we basically recreate the financials out of the bank statements because um, it's really hard to get the bank to misrepresent things. And um, the seller's CPA is like, this is completely wrong. I've never seen work this bad. There's not this, there's not that, there's not, where'd you get, has you ever done a quality of earnings before? And, and so I'm being like yelled at and berated in front of my client, right? And, and, and it was on work that was hard. And I had to remind the, the seller CPA. So with infinite knowledge of every transaction, I think you have a hard time putting together a proof of cash. 
how difficult do you think it was for me with just bank statements and monthly financials and PDF? Did I have enough data to get it perfect? And then he had to back up. I think you're the only person that can get it perfect. Do you want to go get it perfect and send it around? And so part of the game also is pushing people like, dude, I had 30 days. Like <laughs> if you want to like net every single transaction down to the penny, knowing why it was and all this kind of stuff, like you need to go do it. If you want me to do it, here's what I got. And by the way, we're not even off by more than 5%. Like, why am I getting yelled at? But to your point, not all the time do people agree with the work, but my job isn't to get it perfect. It's to use best efforts to give the buyers the best view of a business using sort of tried and true techniques and principles of accounting so that people can make good decisions that will keep them out of trouble in reasonable situations. Did I answer your question? Yeah, you did. And I have one small follow-up behind sure. that. Um, what does these kind of services range as pertain to, like, costs? <laughs> like, give me a, a, yeah, give me a range, if you don't mind. Walker, I love these guys. They get right to it. So um, I'll tell you what we charge, and I'll tell you what kind of is in the market, and I think Walker can sort of validate it. So for deals under $5 million in enterprise value, we charge $15,000 for a quality of earnings. And like ten to twelve thousand dollars for a quality of earnings light, which is a limited scope um, project. We do a proof of cash, so the recreation of the financials from the bank statements for about seven thousand bucks. And then our sort of most detailed quality of earnings services that have a lot of the deal coaching stuff um, is twenty five thousand bucks. And I think the range is I think a lot of groups do something for like five seven thousand bucks. And the top end of the range for deals under ten million dollars is probably forty, fifty thousand dollars at the top end. Um, okay, so higher than that. I mean, you, you can hire diligence teams that will charge you one hundred twenty-five, hundred fifty, no problem. I can introduce anyone on this call to someone who wants to charge for that. <laughs> Thank you. So I was trying to be conservative, but you know, my private equity days, you know, one hundred fifty thousand yeah, dollar QOE yeah, yeah, from Deloitte. Companies. Is, is, yeah. is nothing, you know, and some people do them just to um, keep the naysayers quiet, right? Because nobody argues with the Deloitte quality of earnings, but, right. you know, you pay 150K for it and um, it costs a lot, right? And some of the pricing is cost prohibitive for certain parts of the market. So part of the trick is finding somebody who can do great work at a reasonable price. Hey, Elliot, do you make a recommendation at the end? Like, my recommendation is you buy, or my recommendation is you do not buy? Like, is it that? It's not. It is It is a tap right. dance, Walker, because right. it's right. Um, from a liability perspective. So, and this is important for you guys to know, and, and, and Matt, the lawyer, will, 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 will love this. So the first two pages of the quality of earnings are two pages of legal speak. Um, in really small font, like 10, whole page, right? And it basically says, um, we did the absolute best work that we could do with the limited data we asked for and even less of it that we got from the seller. And had we done more work or had more data, we could have done better. And you understand that we had a, a quality of earnings scope, not an audit scope, an audit would have found certain things. And so we delivered our best work with our best efforts but we're not going to be held liable for the seller doing some really good lying and data that we didn't look at on $15,000 when you're making a $5 million purchase and you come back and try to scrape our $15,000 back. However, um, like any good professional service provider, particularly like an experienced one, the conversation at the end is sort of, so Elliot, what do I do with this? Right. So you're not going to see a recommendation in my report, but we're going to talk about sort of what makes sense to do given the result, right? And that's going to be a lot of verbal communication to kind of limit liability. But one of the things I think we do a real good job of is providing the so what after we get the analysis. So, guys, I'm... I'm Jonathan, as you asked that question, I was I was thinking to myself like, well, what was what, I was trying to think to myself, what was a deal that I was a part of that the diligence team actually was the core reason it blew up? 
That's a great and thing. It's only happened uh, once. It's only happened once. And, um, well, outside of private equity buyers, okay? But, but who knows? There's a lot of smoke and mirrors and, and stuff. Anyway, the point is this. I'm realizing, remember the Foss swimwear case? I hope all of you guys remember the Foss swimwear. So what happened <laughs> was, you remember there was two buyers. There was the first LOI and it fell apart, right? Because of the, we, we talked about how that, that buy, to that particular buyer, it was a high growth business. And then it went under contract and closed to the second buyer, which was, the, it was a platform business for that person, remember? Here's, here's the thing. The first person hired a diligence firm was not, it was not Elliot. It was someone I had never heard of, which just doesn't mean anything. There's a lot of people I don't know. But then I turned to my whole team and no one on my team had heard of him. And it's like, okay. And he claimed he specialized in online business diligence. And it's like, okay, no problem, whatever. Um, it, and this person uh, ran diligence um, and then came back and told the buyer, our recommendation is you do not buy this company. And the buyer told me that at one point, and I remember thinking to myself, the, the diligence, the due diligence team is not the buyer in this instance. And so I felt like they sort of crossed a line, right? So um, whatever you said, I would have supported Elliot, but, but you know, the thing is, is like, they're, like, ultimately they're there to help you move forward knowing that what was presented was true. They're not there to make a decision for you. Right. At least that's that's how I take it. Oh, no, Walker, you are 100 okay. percent correct. Um, all right. And at the end of the day, I remind my clients all the time that I work for you. It's your decision. Yeah. It's your personal guarantee. It's your years of work. And, and you're going to get the upside. You're not going to cut me a check for 10 percent of the earnings. So that's right. um, all I can do is as a service provider. Provide the best service I can based on my point of view and the, the data that we've done. Right. And the. That, that also brings up another good point that I think is important enough to speak about here. So oftentimes what people would do is like get their diligence team and like, hey, guys, go talk to the seller and the seller's broker and just do this diligence thing. Right. And so we have a lighter due diligence list. It's like 40 items. Right. And we made it short on purpose because back in private equity, we had eight pages. It was crazy. Um. But like once I send it to the seller, typically you get, you know, like 50 to 70 percent of the stuff back within a week or two. Right. And then you're asking for more stuff of a seller that's running their own business of a broker that's managing multiple deals who also works for the seller. So they didn't have limited abilities to push. And so I end up having to get back on the phone with my clients and saying, hey, you're the Brinks truck here. You're the big swinging person. And so to get this data. You're going to have to come in and say, hey, without this data, I'm not going to close. You need to get Elliot what he needs because I need to make it a decision. I can say that, but I'm just an accounting firm at the end of the day. You have to come bring the hammer. And so in that context, the buyer is the quarterback. The buyer is the one that makes the decision. No one gets paid, usually. The buyer pays everybody, just so, yes. just so you understand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When the deal closes, the buyer <laughs> pays everybody. Okay, yes. the buyer pays the bank. The buyer pays the closing fees. The buyer pays the seller. The buyer really indirectly pays the broker. Uh, the M and A firm almost always gets paid out of, directly out of escrow because it's a transaction service, and there's no more operations on the seller's entity. Right, um, Elliot. I, I have a question about um, diligence on a stock sale versus an asset sale, but Blair has had her hand up. Sure. So, Let's just put it in that player. Oh, yeah. I have uh, two questions that kind of go together. So um, when should, in the buying process, when should you start interviewing due diligence firms? And do you have any tips on how to interview due diligence firms and what type of questions you should be asking? Great question. So I think there's like a pre-qual and then a final qualification. And, and this is me being completely honest because it doesn't benefit me to have the two rings of it, but I, I think even walk around understand why. When you first get started, not like day one, but sort of a couple of months in when you send a couple of offers and you kind of get your feet wet, you should start looking at diligence providers because if you get a deal under LOI sooner than you think, you're going to want to have had some conversation with folks so you kind of know what's going on. You don't want to get caught your fourth month in, you haven't talked to anybody. You have an LOI where the, the seller wants to close in 60 days, which would be okay if you had a good diligence firm, 
but now you got to spend a week and a half interviewing folks and it's too tight. The other time you want to do it is sort of when you send that LOI that you think they're going to sign, like you've had a couple of kind of back and forth email negotiations, but you think you're sort of at the end. That's when you want to kind of think about who are the top two firms I've talked to and, and pick one and go with them. And the reason you do it as you're sending that LOI and not after you have it is because of timing. You need to make sure your, your favorite firm has capacity, that they um, that they can have the right people on that deal, that they know the deal is coming so they can reserve that capacity. And so if they have issues, they can let you know. Um, how do you diligence the diligence firm? Walker, you got these are these are great questions. No idea. <laughs> so. The first is if you can find a place that provides recommendations or ratings, right? So searchfunder.com does that. Um, you can go to LinkedIn and see um, how people speak about the folks that you're working with. Now Google has, you know, that information too. So um, the first thing I would do is check the ratings. Now ratings can be skewed because typically the sample size is low, um, but that's a good place to start. Referrals, a great place to start. But if you find yourself in a position where you don't have those, the best way I can tell you how to do it is get a sample quality of earnings from them and look through it and see if you can make a decision based on the work that they did. And I think the reason why that works so well is, you know, I've been doing this for like 15 years, right? And I can't tell you how many times I've looked at documents from very reputable firms, both on the accounting side and the legal side, that were sort of blatantly wrong or inadequate. Right. Meaning that not every document from a single firm is the same. And so the reason you get a sample is to see, hey, the sample kind of sets the basis for here's what you're going to get. That's why we're sending it as a sample. And if you can look through it and say, hey, this is well written. I understand it. It's written at my level. That kind of helps you understand that this is what I'm going to actually get from the firm. Um, unless you're an accountant, you're not going to be able to sort of ask super pressing questions. The other thing to ask to evaluate diligence firms, whatever the top two or three fears that you have in the deal, ask them, is that included in the quality of earnings? And since some of them are a little bit art and science, ask them how comfortable they are doing them. So there's very seasonal working capital here and I'm buying it out of season. You know, I want to get a good peg. You know, can you guys help me with that? and then just see what they say. That's my recommendation on how to check your diligence firm. Thank you, that helps so much. You're very welcome. Blair, did you have a, another question? No, the, those were the two questions, when to interview and what should you ask? Copy that. Um, Luis, you had your hand up earlier. Do you have a question? If not, we'll go to Matt. Uh, and I, I think that uh, my question was resolved when he talked about uh, yeah. the challenges. Yeah. Thank you. Matt. Hey, Elliot. Hey. So uh, what are the most reliable red flags that you've seen like over and over that either, you know, a seller is being dishonest or there's something, you know, something seriously wrong with the business? Great question. Um, and this is we're back in the street now because this, this is not in the book anywhere. Um, and Matt, you're the lawyer, right? So you, you, you deal in negotiations and leverage. You didn't graduate yet. But you, you finished, you finished <laughs> one L yet? <laughs> Did you finish one L? Yeah, I'm at two L. All right. Well, you, you got the, the Mike Tyson punch. So, um, good data comes quickly. So bad bad data typically comes slowly and and it's not a, a hard and fast rule but when you have like a old school seller their old school broker old school cpa all stonewalling you on data screaming that they don't have this and don't have that or i can't pull it or it's only available on every other saturday when that person comes out of the woods and looks at the computer for a minute that's one of the bigger red flags. And it's tougher for me to communicate that when the clients, because it's not a number. It's just, I've been doing this 15 years. And when people want to sell a business for a million dollars, they get you data. Um, the others are, 
sometimes there's like a principal thing that enables the business to be sellable that like comes out really strongly in the confidential information memorandum from the broker. And the first two or three pieces of data you get that should support that major thing don't pan out. So like diversified customer base or something like that. And then you get in there and it's like Walmart, St. Louis, Walmart, Jacksonville, Walmart, you know, Memphis. And all of a sudden you're like, hey, you know, a big piece of why I'm able to buy this is diversified customer base. These are really aren't diversified. So something that like was obvious to everyone that comes back different. Um, the other big red flag is issues of integrity, right? Which, which even Walker mentioned earlier. So if, um, if a seller tells you something is red and it's something they deal with every day and you find out it's green, you probably want to stop or at least say, Hey, that was misinformation that I feel uncomfortable with. And so we need to we need to discuss kind of that. And I think um, those things are sometimes harder to catch because a lot of stuff changes during diligence. And so, Matt, one of the challenges is that some things a seller doesn't know, some things aren't knowable, some things aren't easy to explain, particularly someone who's not in the business. So you have to sort of rule those out. But if you feel like you're being lied to, stop. So those are some of the bigger red flags. It's interesting, you know, most deals don't die because like EBITDA is off 10 or 20%. They, they die because there's malicious misrepresentation of data. There's huge sort of catastrophic risk that can't be mitigated. Um, or honestly, another thing that happens is like smart parties argue their way out of a good deal, which frustrates both Walker and I. So, yeah. Yeah, when people talk to themselves, that are good. Um, one one question, Elliot, is um, Matt, I'm sorry, were you done? Yeah. So, uh, one, let's see. Um, like I was in uh Mexico. Um, I don't know, almost 20 years ago. I'm going from Guadalajara to the coast, and I jump on a bus with a couple of friends. Right. And they gave us a sandwich. And we were like, oh, sweet. Like, they gave us a sandwich. You know, all, yeah. we, all I had was this, you know, beer can or whatever. You yeah, know? yeah. And we, you know, we go a couple hours or whatever. I start eating the sandwich. And, like, it's, I mean, it's, you know, I don't remember what it was. A piece of bologna with, you know, a piece of cheese or whatever. I got to the middle of the sandwich. And right. I take a bite. Anyone know what I got? A slice oh. of jalapeno. Jonathan, what? Oh, I said a piece of bone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It was a jalapeno. Yeah. Okay, just a, just a one jalapeno right in the middle of this like sandwich, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and we all started laughing and we started calling it. Oh, they slipped you a chili, right? And so this became this like inside joke. To this day, okay, I still call it. Oh, they slipped you a chili when you're like you've rounded third base, like everything's done, like the whole legal agreement is negotiated, but maybe not quite signed. The bank loan isn't isn't closed yet. And then all of a sudden, that day before close, you know where I'm going with this, yeah. they, they, they take you out back or whatever it is, yeah. and they sort of nonchalantly, you know, send an email or like mention something that happened or like, you know, casually said something on the way to the car that's like actually disclosing information. And you have to identify that moment as I just got slipped a jalapeno, yep. right? Yeah. Um, how do, you, how do you get engaged in, in these situations or how often do you see that? Or is that after your sort of work is done or, you know, I mean, I mean, that might be, that might be post diligence technically, but. Sometimes I think, I think sometimes people think of my services as sort of the financial part. And then like their timeline says you stop dealing with Elliot and you go somewhere else. Uh -huh. um, a lot of my clients deal with me kind of consistently through the process because I'm sort of like their deal coach or deal advisor because they kind of understand my background. And, and once you become kind of part of the guardian family, um, I'm very happy to help you because to me, it's it's helping you get a good deal done or stopping you from doing a bad one. That's what I feel like my job is. The whole slip of chili thing, I think the first thing is you have to evaluate how, how big and bad and nasty is the chili, right? Yeah. Um, is the chili going to put you on your back? Um, is it going to cause catastrophic risk? Is it, you know, is it, 
is it cancerous? You know, is it is it is it is it is it a deal killer or an inconvenient truth? So, for instance, I'll give you a great example, guys. So um, when I was doing deals like 2015, 2016, you write working capital into the letter of intent. You say, I plan on buying working capital and I think working capital will be the average of the last 12 months. And here's the number. Boom. And at close, you get working capital. Um, right now, it's a seller's market. And so a lot of times people will write in working capital. They'll define what they think it is and they'll get to the legal agreement. And when the seller realizes that working capital is revenue, he or she sold, that they expected to come in their pocket, that now you want to run your business when they didn't get startup money like that, they want to take it. And a lot of my clients get irate about that. And um, I don't know if, if Walker's ever heard me say this, but a lot of times I'm sort of like, hey, it's a great deal. Great deals are hard to find. It's inconvenient, but you're well enough capitalized to handle it. Your lender will put in a working capital line to protect you because they want you to win. And you probably need to go home and sleep on whether this is an inconvenient chili in your sandwich that's still delicious or something you can eat around, or is this a deal killer? And, and sometimes the hubris and the pride of people get in the way of like reason. And we've all been in situations where a minuscule thing that we blew up causes great pain. And I like, I'll give a specific instance. That exact thing happened to a client who was buying a golf e-commerce business. It was a 55 year old dude that used to run a cruise ship line in Southern Florida with this 75 year old rich mentor. And they um, had scoured the earth for deals and you're in South Florida and you find a golf e-commerce business at a reasonable price in the range that you're looking to buy that the seller actually went on a trip to Montana, but delivered every piece of data within 24 hours, two weeks straight. I've never seen this efficient work on vacation. Um, and I kind of told him when the working capital thing came up, I'm like, client, you're rich. Your guy's richer. And your bank has capital. So for an amount of money that you can afford that won't kill your ROI, you can fix this problem. You're frustrated and I get it. But like, it hasn't changed your your decision, your your return on investment, your deal plan. You know, I advise you to consider sort of paying for the working capital and getting a good deal done because if not, you start from square one and, and who knows if you'll find this again. Excellent. Um, we've been going an hour, uh, so I want to be sensitive. Elliot, I mean, do you have a Time for one more question? Yeah, I have time for one or two more questions. I, I enjoy this and I want to make sure if someone's kind of been lurking in Excellent. the back, holding their question, uh, come on. Excellent. Robert. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, hi, Elliot. Thank you for being here. Sure. Uh, kind of expanding off of uh, Matt's question, um, for the deal in Dallas, um, was there anything leading up to that uh, QuickBooks fiasco um, that was more on the intuitive or instinctual side that was raising red flags with you? kind of getting away, straying a little bit from the quantitative side. Was there anything that you just were picking up on intuitively uh, from the seller that was creating red flags for you? The, the orange flag for me there, looking back on it, was that the seller had bought the business like three years previous. And that's really not enough time to get your return out of it. And so I was, I was being told that he realized he wasn't the one to grow the business and came out of a corporate like HR role. And even I thought that kind of person would be outmatched running a pretty blue collar, but like enterprise sales business. Um, but that was sort of the thing that looking back on it, if I see a business and it, it's not a hard and fast rule, but a business that just recently traded hands, I'm just a bit more cautious, but I would say. Depends on the growth. It depends on a million things, right? Um, the age of the seller, um, the hotness of the market, right? If you had an FBA store uh, last year and it held it for one year, um, you might be able to sell it for some ungodly multiple to some private equity group out of New York. That made perfect sense to me. Um, your, your daughter's a uh, junior in high school and you wanna spend your last two years with her and not on the road. Um, 
there's a health condition that I may or may not want to disclose or the seller may or may not want to disclose for whatever reason. So there's plenty of good reasons for that not to be. And that's why I call it like an orange flag and not red. Um, the other thing I'll say, Robert, is as a buyer, one of the things you have to determine is how fast you're going to parse deals. And how quickly you're going to make decisions and how willing you are to make an investment to go see a person if you like a deal. And that's all discretion because I've seen, I kind of stopped working with clients who spent too long producing letters of intent. I was doing some more kind of deal coaching in the beginning of 2021. And for folks who like I've been working with for like three or four months that hadn't sent a letter of intent, I kind of worked my way out of those arrangements because they were moving too slow to have a probability of winning. So the other thing is just, um, this is one of those processes where like there's very few hard and fast rules outside of don't buy what, what walker said don't buy a business from a person you don't trust ah uh, jonathan excellent question sure so it depends um jonathan on who you use so um for me i charge half up front half when we finish the quality of earnings and so my fees still get paid if the deal doesn't close but as I said earlier, my fees are on the lower end of sort of comparable fees for quality of earnings. I also prorate all my stuff over four weeks. So um, if we figure out in like a week that the deal stinks, you're only sort of you only owe me one week of the of the stuff. And a lot of times if we break up on a first deal and you get another deal within a reasonable amount of time, I'll sort of forget about the first piece and kind of start fresh without charging you again. Um, some firms are open to um, taking their fee on contingency. So they will get paid when the deal closes or something like that. And then they'll take a smaller fee if the deal doesn't close. And I think what I have to remind people is like some of these big firms have huge budgets and run like corporations. And so they're, they're able to do things that a, a smaller business like myself can't. And for me, um, the level of work that I go into to protect my clients from making million dollar bad decisions, I can't do it as well if I'm worried about getting paid. The other thing that people like me recognize, but um, I hear it tossed around a lot on Twitter and other and search funder, like, oh, don't worry, I'll do it on contingency, man. I'll pay you if the deal doesn't close. And I know too well from my buyer days that a lot of times people aren't well enough capitalized to do that. So it, it just depends, right? Different firms have different policies and, and you should find one that kind of fits your needs. Yeah, I mean, I would look at that as services rendered. I mean, you're not, you're, you're almost getting paid to save them from a bad deal. So they only pay 25 grand instead of 5 million if they max you out, right? So yeah, that's I mean, exactly you, it. You just saved $5 million by paying 25 grand in that instance. So. Um, anything else for Elliot? Elliot, thank you so much for being here. If, if we were all in person um, at the beautiful campus that is the only school of business, I would be handing you a little bag with a ribbon on it. It would have some awesome branded stuff. Instead, I do have this little calculator here. I think I might get a um, like a wash you sticker. I'll put it on the back and maybe maybe we can save some people from a bad deal. I'm just kidding. I'll, send you, <laughs> I'll, I'll get you an email. And we'll, we'll, we'll get you something. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you. Glad sharing. to be here. Walker, so so happy about the opportunity. Guys, I dropped my website in the chat, so check that out. Um, my email and phone number on there are pretty easy to get in contact with. Um, I love that you guys are interested enough to stick it out for an hour. Um, come check me out when you get your deal under LOI. Thanks, Elliot. Thanks, guys. All right, thanks, team. Class is over. Um, I do have a couple of minutes if anyone has um, wants to hang back um, and have any questions. Luis. Yeah, um, just to recap on what you said um, at the beginning of the of the session, we're supposed to send you and Chelsea an email about the teams, right? Yeah. Um, so let's please wait until um, Thursday. Just 